So welcome to this Saturday afternoon session at Shiloh Centre in Toowoomba, Australia. It's a special community weekend here for us and we're having a teaching gathering here this afternoon and tomorrow we meet with the local house churches coming together. We now have four local house churches in the Toowoomba, close Toowoomba area and we sort of are responsible for the one at Caboolture so there's five house churches now that are really functioning with, with Shiloh in the home area as well as a number of house churches through the nation. We've always believed in house churches and slowly God is allowing us to uh, plant more and more of them, praise the Lord. So, just want to give you a bit of feedback. I might need, need Janet to help me because I've lost that, uh, that connection. Here it is. This is from Brother Peter Katumbi of uh, the Kengemi Apostolic Company. Peter's an apostle, married to uh, Tabitha, his wife, who's called a pastor and also is a teacher. They work with Apostle Dorcas Kamau. Dorcas was here a few years ago for training. We see Peter every time we go to Kenya, of course. He's a key, key brother who supports us. And this is what he wrote last week when his wife was away with Dorcas on mission in Tanzania. Peter's home in his home and he said, Shalom, Mum and Papa, I hope you are fine. Thank you for the DVDs for the last school. I'm receiving great insight through the teachings. The testimony of RMA and Shiloh School of Ministry was so touching. I wanted to see how Yahweh can use a committed team to reach nations with the gospel of the kingdom. May God greatly bless Shiloh team as it serves the purpose of God in our generation. Powerful messages from all the ministers. Isn't that beautiful feedback? Hallelujah. And so, God's never allowed us to grow very big organisationally or numbers of people, but he's allowed us to penetrate many nations with key people receiving the, the teaching and being changed by it and then being able to go and teach others. Hallelujah. So it's a wonderful testimony. So many, so many awesome things are happening. I just want to move into the Word of God now and the, and the title is The Good Confession. This message first began to come in the, in the uh, September school and I've been developing it since and I've become... Uh, What's the word? Caught up in it. And so even this afternoon coming in here, you know, Rhoda said something about herself. And I said, hey, Rhoda, we're about a good confession today. And she straight away changed it and, and took herself out of saying something negative about herself. Because so often what we confess is really silly. You know, we say terrible things about ourselves, not even meaning to. Sometimes we mean to when we're really, really cranky with ourselves. But we, and then we really oppress ourselves, or the devil helps us oppress ourselves. But, but the key to come out of so many things is simply to agree with the Word of God. You know, there's, a, there's a newer version of Amazing Grace that has those extra words. We, those of you at Lara's funeral, we sang it there. And, but we got it on a CD at home, we're listening to it over and over again at the moment. All the songs, but this particular one says, The Lord... The Lord has promised good to me. That's Yahweh. What an amazing statement. The Lord God Almighty of the whole universe has promised good to me. What about you? He's promised good to you as well. Isn't that amazing? That we can engage with the God of the universe, the creator of all things, and, and he says to us in the, wherever he says it, in the psalm I think, the Lord has promised good to me. Is that it? Ah, oh, I've been blessed by that lately. The Lord has promised good to me, I say to Janet. You too. The Lord has promised good to us. Did you know that, Darlene? The Lord has promised good to you. Amen. Amen. So when you look in the mirror and you look a bit, you know, strange, say, hey, come on, girl, come on, man. The Lord, the Eternal One, has promised good to you. Amen. Amazing. And so we want to learn a few things this afternoon about developing a good confession. And how do we do that? The headings that will come up in due course, the first one, Nick, is by pursuing righteousness. The second one is by fighting the good fight of faith. Leave that till we get to it. And the third one is in the sight of God. That sounds good, doesn't it? We're pursuing righteousness by fighting the good fight of faith in the sight of God. That will lead to us having a good confession. So let's open up in 1 Timothy chapter 6. This is our it's a passage here from 6 to uh, 11 to 16 that we're going to work through today at some level. 
So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, which says, But you, O man of God, if you're a female, just put yourself in there as well. There's no exclusivity because the man word appears there. Flee these things. So we have to look back in a moment and see what those things were. We've got to flee. And pursue some things. We are to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, patience, or love, sorry. Love, patience, and gentleness. And of course that's not an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty powerful one, isn't it? So Paul had been instructing Timothy, and I'm just going to summarise the verse 3 to 10 for you, not read them. But I found that in that he's instructing Timothy to flee from error. So what's Timothy to flee from? Error. error. Secondly, Timothy is to flee from greed. What's the second one? Greed. greed. And what is greed? It's any form of self-seeking or covetousness. So self-seeking is wanting something for yourself that you haven't got and, and you're going after it. That's a form of covetousness. It's a form of greed. It's wanting something you haven't got. The commandment warns us, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, thy neighbour's goods, anything that belongs to your neighbour. Don't think you should have it. Or just because so-and-so's got a new model car, don't think you should have it because it'll, it'll just slow you down, get you off focus. Because greed is any form of self-seeking or covetousness. <clears throat> then Paul warns Timothy to, to flee from harmful lusts. Who knows that pursuing a lust is always brings harm? Because once you become consumed with the lust, you, you, you lose your judgment. You no longer are governed by righteousness. You're just governed by that strong intensity of feeling that you want what you want and you want it now. And you'll do anything to get it. Not worrying about the consequences until next day or whatever. Okay. And finally, from the love of money. You know, the, the old version tended to say that, that the love of money is the root of all evil. If you look at it carefully, it says it's a root of all of evil. Money's not the root of all evil. What's the root of all evil? Satan. Satan and our sin. Yeah. So, but but the love of money can easily become sinful. The love of money, rather than just using money as the medium it's meant to be, we can become consumed with with wanting to have a certain amount or whatever it is. And then we, we were followed by a guy in his little open sports car <laughs> coming down the street today. And it just, just spoke such a message. You know, he's got his nice sunglasses on. He's fairly cool looking. And he's got the roof back. And, you know, breezing down the main street at Toowoomba at 40 kilometres an hour is not very exciting in an open sports car. But he looked like he was enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, he wanted everyone to see him. So, main street was very busy this afternoon. Okay. So just go through those quickly again. Paul has been instructing us to flee from error, from greed, from harmful lusts, and the love of money. So we need to repent of our involvement in sinful practices such as those. So repent means simply to think it through and change your mind. You Be your own guardian. Be your own judge. Realise, hey, the way I'm going is no good for me. You know, sooner or later, every man, every woman's got to take responsibility for the course of their life. And so if, if doing something every day is just making you feel worse and, worse and worse, finally one day you go, hey, I'm on the wrong track here. I've got to stop using these drugs. I've got to stop drinking every afternoon. I've got to stop whatever it is, overeating. Because it'll kill you probably in the end if you don't. So what do you do? You repent. You, you have a change of mind. You realise, hey, pursuing that's not helping me at all. In fact, that's going down the gurgle every time. Let's, let's step back from that. Repentance is as simply as that. It's just stopping. Because you think it through and say, no, 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 that's no good for me. I'd rather choose righteousness. Hallelujah. So the second heading then is, we develop a good conscience by fighting the good fight of faith, Paul says. So how do we fight the good fight of faith? That's in, in verse 12. How do we fight the good fight of faith? How do we train to fight? And that's what this session is about. Training you so you can fight the good fight of faith. And, and the key message for today is by developing a good confession. So how do we fight? How do we train? By fleeing some things and pursuing others because we love God. 
you know, I can't, I can't fight it since, but I read in the Passion Scriptures a few months back when I gave Janet a copy for Christmas, and some of them are quite interesting, but his definition of a righteous person in one of the Scriptures was simply a person who loves God. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful description of righteousness? I'm a righteous man. Why? I love God. Because I love God, I try to please Him. I try to do things right because I love Him. Not because he says to do this, the way you're going to do this and this. No. I'm righteous because I love God. My sins have been washed away. He, he loves me, but I love him. And then in, in the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8, another favourite quickened word for me in the last few weeks. You know, what does, what does the Yahweh require of you, O man, O woman? To do justice, to love mercy. Oh, that's a big ask, isn't it? Who knows, it's pretty hard to show mercy sometimes because you just feel like kicking the person. They don't deserve mercy. But the Bible says to love mercy. Take every opportunity to help people who don't deserve it. And to walk humbly with your God. But the one that's really blessing me is, what's it mean to do justice? And I simply came up with this answer. It's to show respect to people. If you show respect to people, they'll be blessed. They'll, they'll, they'll be a little bit closer to fulfilling their God-given destiny. Because every time we show respect to one another, we're, we're recognising you're, you're a man or a woman called of God. You've got a mighty calling in your life and I respect you for that. That's not what you say all the time, but just if you have that heart, then how you treat people is, is doing justice. And I just believe that the simple pendulum of justice is to show respect to anybody and everybody. Amen. Show respect to the street person and they'll probably respond differently. Show, show respect to the, to the lady who's serving at the checkout. Who, who knows it'll change her day. Before you know it, she's smiling and telling you something. Or the lady who welcomes you to the coffee shop. If you just show her respect, she'll even make you more welcome than you already were. We found this out last Monday morning, went into a coffee shop. We'd never been there before. And this lovely, not, not a young lady, but greeted us. And we were blessed by her greeting, so we responded. And we built a relationship with that lady in, in about three minutes by showing respect, appreciating her. You know, we, I think it was, might have been the last time we booked in at the International Airport and, and we're on Qantas, unfortunately, and don't like flying on homosexual airlines, but anyway. Um, and there's and no, no longer line up at the counter. You go to a machine and book yourself in. But being country yokels, we pretend we know nothing about machines, so we cry out, please help! And this lovely Qantas lady, probably, I don't know what middle age is anymore, but she looked about 50 or bit, bit, probably more. Yeah, she said, I only got a few years to retire. But she was really hassled because so many people needed help. Because no one, just about no one feels comfortable with those machines. <laughs> so everybody's waiting for this one lady to help us. But she came and helped our team. By the time she finished helping us, she was smiling, she was encouraged, because uh, we just kept building her up. We thanked her for her help. We said, it's so good to talk to a person, not to try and handle this machine on our own. We know because you've helped us, it's been done right. Thank you, Sam. And, and then I said to her, you know, you've got a difficult job, haven't you? She says, I have. And I've only got so many years to retire. And I said, well, God bless you. <laughs> See, show respect to people. Appeal to them, particularly if they've got some official job. And... and They'll do their very best for you before you know it. Amen. Amen. You know, when Simon was last out here with his wife, he, 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 we took him to the airport, and, and that morning they got quite well-dressed, and I said, you guys are well-dressed for travellers. He said, we always travel when we, always dress well when we travel, people treat us better. And I thought, oi, that's, I mean, I dress reasonably well when I travel, I haven't worn a tie yet, I'm thinking about it. But, <laughs> But it's true, if people turn up well-dressed, they'll treat you better. So Simo had found a key. So anyway, get back on track, Paul. So how do we fight the good fight of faith? By fleeing from those things. We gave some examples of that. And pursuing other things. So what are some of the things we should pursue? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience and gentleness. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it? You know, to try and review your life every day. How have I been pursuing righteousness today? Have I been pursuing godliness today? What does it even mean to pursue godliness? Faith. Love. Patience. 
gentleness. So this, this is how we train ourselves to get a good confession. Because every little breakthrough you get, you, you'll want to talk to someone about it. Amen? You'll want to tell someone. Guess what's happened? God has helped me today. And so what's the purpose of this? It's to lay hold on eternal life, Paul says in verse 11. Verse 12, that should be. To lay hold on eternal life. Always keep your focus on the goal, which is, oh, just getting my family fixed up or just doing... No, the goal is eternal life. The goal is living forever with God in, a wondrous, in the wondrous plan of God that will be unfolding forever. How amazing is God's promise to us. So don't, don't let your focus get off eternal life. Whatever's going down that's, that's hurting you, that's troubling you, that's, that's confronting you, always keep your focus on eternal life. It's well worth it, brethren, to pursue righteousness, Amen. godliness, faith, love, patience and gentleness in the context of staying in eternal life. So Jude says to us in verse 20 and 21, I'll just quote part of it, that we are to be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. <laughs> Keep eternal life in focus. No matter how much even church people let you down, ministers let you down, even hurt your life seriously, don't get off on that. It'll only hurt you now, more now. Come back to your focus on eternal life. Thank God for eternal life. We need to experience eternal life every day. Is this our mate? Hey, welcome brother. See, I, I tried to prophesy to some of you that were coming and none of you believed me and I didn't believe myself anymore. Good on you, Rob. Amen. When did you confess Christ? Sooner or later you have to go public. Sooner or later you have to tell other people, hey, I'm confessing Christ now. Um, some of you have seen a movie called, um, what's it about potatoes, what's it called? Faith like, Faith like potatoes. And, and when the hero in the story, it's a real story, Angus Buck, and when he, when he was first confessing Christ, he, he, met, he came out of sort of giving his life to Jesus in the, in the pastor's house or something, wasn't it? and then he's walking down the street and he, and he sees these people he knows and he's trying to hide from them. Because he's just had this amazing experience, but the last thing in the world he wants to do is have to tell his drinking mates that I've just had this amazing experience and I'm changed. Because <laughs> hey? it's a bit like that sometimes, isn't it? The most precious thing you've got, but you're still not ready to tell somebody. <laughs> but sooner or later, we have to tell somebody. And in fact, the more we do that, the stronger our confession becomes. We need to be confessing what we know about Jesus. Well, I'd even like to change that, what we know of Jesus. It's one thing to know about Jesus, but what do you know of Jesus, of the man, of the real person? What do you know of him? And this becomes, because this confession of who Jesus is, is the vital part of the good fight of faith. You know, we, we can get off on a spiritual trip without keeping Jesus central. Sometimes I hear Christians, other ministers, you know, talking about what the big program they're doing, the big plan they're doing, and I'm listening. Are they going to say the name of Jesus? I'm listening. Are they going to talk about Jesus Christ? I'm listening. And I get, often get disappointed. And I think, Lord, did you speak to those people to do that? Because they're not talking about you in it. They're not giving you any glory. They're talking about their program. Anyway, the third point about this developing a good confession is it's in the sight of God. This is exciting. Paul says in um, verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God. Uh huh. What's that mean? Well, if you know, you can turn if you want to have a look. But in, in Genesis chapter 4, there is the account, is that the right thing? The account of Cain killing his brother Abel. It's not a story, it's the account. And do you know, if you look at it carefully, Cain and Abel and their family lived in the sight of God. 
And Cain killed his brother in the presence of Yahweh. And then if you read it carefully, God turned up and judged Cain. And then verse 16 of Genesis chapter 4 says, And Cain went out from the presence of Yahweh. So the first family, even though they were put out of the garden, they were not put out of the presence of God. God was with them mm. and manifested in that, that sanctuary that was placed there in, Gen in Genesis 3 verse 24 and the flaming sword. And the, and the family still came and worshipped God and brought their lamb sacrifice if they were wise and obedient. But Cain brought the work of his hands to offer to God. But anyway, not worrying about that story, the fact is that Cain even murdered his brother in the presence of God. Amen. Being in the presence of God does not stop you from doing stupid things. But, yeah. but on the other hand, being in the presence of God helps you to stop doing stupid things. Didn't stop Cain, but it was meant to. God even warned Cain. Spoke to him personally. Cain, you need to change, man. You, you, you're going, you're hell bent to hell, the way you're behaving. But Cain just got more and more upset and sour with God then. Okay, so it's happening in the sight of God. So do not leave the presence. Stay in eternal life. God is there all the time. Who knows the last two words of, of the book of Ezekiel? And the name of the city shall be called Yehovah or Yahweh Shema. What's that mean? That the eternal God is present there. So Yehovah Shema or Yahweh Shema means the Lord God Almighty is with us. He's there. He's there at Shiloh when we gather. It's not that he's sitting around Shiloh waiting for us to gather, but when we gather, he's here. Amen? God doesn't sit around in buildings. He, he's in people. Yes. And when we come together, we become that corporate Amen. dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So we live in the sight of Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah, Jesus. If you can't lift your hand up and give Jesus a wave in whatever you're doing, then maybe you need to change what you're doing. Make sure what you're doing is in the sight of Jesus. Okay, major point number two then is the good confession of Messiah Jesus. In 1 Timothy 6.13, Paul... Where are you? You already said number three before. What, in the sight of God? Yeah, that's the third point under number one. <laughs> so that's, that's point number one, A, B and C. Now point number two is, in, in caps lock, the good confession of Messiah Jesus. It, sorry, Nick. In 1 Timothy 6.13, here I'm in trying to get you to take really good notes and I'm just confusing the man. In 1 Timothy 6.13, Paul is referring to the good confession of Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Let us look at that confession. Turn with me in, in John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 36. Point number two, the heading is the good confession of Messiah Jesus. Hmm. And I don't really have any sub points. <laughs> So let's look at John 18.36. Jesus answered. He's, he's answering the governor Pilate, the Roman governor. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So the two powerful statements there are, my kingdom, Jesus said, is not of this world. My kingdom is not from here, not from this earthly place. Amen? Paul says that's the good confession. But it didn't stop there. Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to Jesus, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone is of the truth, hears my voice 
Jesus would not deny the truth no matter what the consequences were. If any one of us dares to believe that Jesus is the King, that means he is the Christ, the Messiah, we will know the truth and be able to come into covenantal relationship with him. See, the awesome thing about God is that he's not some far off person. His, his, his creative intention was always to have a creation that related to him. That, that all that God is would be poured out into his creation and there would be that response to him. Even in the New Testament it's talked about the response of a glorious bride church. That, that the response he would find in the world would be that of a, of a bride responding to a husband. That that, that, that that which God had created would finally bring forth a people who would totally want to respond to God. And so the good confession of Jesus was that he was able to stand before the judgment seat of Pilate and speak the truth. Humbly, firmly, no doubt. You and I, if we've come to know Jesus, we have that same privilege. We can humbly confess the truth. Doesn't matter how we feel, it's the truth. The truth is not based on feelings, it's not based on thoughts. The truth is the truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. So the truth is actually a person. So when we come to confess the truth, which is Jesus, our lives change. And when we confess that I believe in Jesus, I believe that Jesus loves me, that he took away my sins, and I have asked Jesus to come into my life, and he has, I'm in covenant relationship with him. But most of us in the beginnings of our Christian life were not it was not explained to us what covenantal relationship means and how easily but how powerfully we all come into that covenant relationship just by saying yes to Jesus. And in one sense, when we're baptised, that seals the deal. It's like the baptism, in a sense, is the marriage ceremony. The lost soul is now saved. Their sins are washed away. They're believing in Jesus. So they come to the waters, and that's like the marriage, in a sense. That, that you totally yield, die, and rise in Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's powerful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, we won't focus on that. <laughs> but I just wanted to bring the illustration. But, you know, Peter says that, that baptism is the answer of a good conscience. It's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. The blood does that. We ask God to forgive our sins. He forgives them and washes them away. But then our conscience is clear and we say, oh, I want to be baptised now. I want to be joined with Jesus fully. I want to be clothed with Christ. I want to be in him, in his death, in his burial and in his resurrection. No longer, no longer having to live out of that old man who wants to do all those things like we read in Timothy. You know, love money and harmful lusts and greed and error and yeah. whatever it was. Amen. Oh, sorry. Hold back page here. So <laughs> the next sub-point under that big heading, Nick, is okay. confessing the covenant. Oh. Confessing the covenant. Say, confessing the covenant. Confessing the covenant. There are many marvellous covenantal promises in the word of God. Paul, Peter refers to them in his second epistle, is it? Yeah. Or first epistle? First epistle. The great and precious yeah. promises of God. That, that when we believe them, we are brought in to become partakers of the divine nature. Or Godhead. If you can start to understand Godhead, divine nature, godliness... The mystery of God is you're starting to understand how to be godly. Simple terms, just be in relationship with God. And you'll be godly because you're linked to God. Godliness is obviously living like God, behaving like God, being like God. And he, he says we can do it because he gives us the grace. Having a good confession is being able to state accurately and truthfully the word of God. That's why we encourage so much here at Shiloh and in the apostolic company worldwide, for, for disciples to learn scriptures off by heart. So, you, so you're never caught without having a word to speak. You, you just learn to confess the word of God. 
sooner or later that confession is going to dawn on your conscience you're going to say hey I actually believe that <laughs> amen <laughs> so so it's it's just it's been such a such a major thing in my own life as a baby Christian I used to write scriptures on a piece of cardboard put them in my wallet and every, every opportunity I had at work to read those scriptures I would those were the days when we stopped for smoke I'd, I'd read my scripture <laughs> You know, you know where smoker comes from, don't you? Time to stop, never smoke. No, let's stop and read the scripture. And, uh, wow. <laughs> In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, did we have this today already, Nick mentioned it? Paul exhorts us that we should have a confession of Jesus Christ as apostle and high priest. Now, when we, when we discovered that verse a few years ago, we found that the, most of the rest of the church had never discovered it yet. So everywhere we went, we'd read that verse out and say, what's it mean to have a confession of Jesus Christ, apostle and high priest? No idea. Never heard of such a thing. And so we've been teaching and preaching that confession. What it means to say Jesus is the apostle. What it means to say Jesus is the high priest. And I'll be teaching this in West Africa again next week because it's still so fundamental for people to start to understand who Jesus is. So according to Hebrews 3.1, Jesus has two major ministry aspects. The apostle, there's a specific ministry, high priest, another specific ministry. Amen. Differently, when Peter had the big revelation in Matthew 16, when Jesus said, who do you say to him? What did Peter answer? You are the Christ, the Son of God. He's not referring to ministries there. He's talking to officers. Jesus, you are the, you are the king the coming king, the anointed king, and you are the son of God. So they're two awesome titles of who Jesus is. But apostle and high priest are not titles. They're ministry functions. Jesus has has fulfilled his ministry as the apostle by coming to the earth, and Jesus fulfilled his ministry as the high priest by dying on the cross for our sins. This word confession has the connotation, and this is a big, big statement that Nick found somewhere in our I've read it before as well. It's a binding public declaration by which a legal relation is contractually established. You know, it's legal language, so forget about it. It's very hard to understand. But it's telling us that this word confession is powerful. It, when you confess the word of God, it has a legal aspect to it. When you say, I am saved through faith in Jesus Christ, you've made a covenantal statement and the devil can't touch you. I am saved by the blood of the Lamb. I overcome the the accuser of the brethren by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of my testimony and I love not my life to the death. Oh, you start to say that a few times, you'll change. You'll become bold. You're not even afraid to die. It has the sense of bringing us into covenant with God as we confess Jesus Christ and his word. This word literally means To speak the same word. So, speak the scripture. Do you know, back in the days of King Henry VIII, it was illegal to have an English scripture in your house. It was illegal to teach your children the Lord's Prayer in English. Men were were arrested and taken away from their families, tortured, sometimes even put to death for having English scriptures in their home and teaching them to their children. So we've come a long way in, what is it, about 700 years or something since he was around? Or 600. When did he live? 14th century? 15. 15th century, 1400s, wasn't it? No? No. 1500s, you're right. Same, same time as the Reformation. It's part of the Reformation, yep. You're right. Okay, so that's what? 400 years ago. 500, yeah, 500. Luther Mission is 500 years old. Okay. So the next little heading, Nick, is confession is powerful. Let, let's turn, in case you don't know it off by heart, to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. You know, Paul says that our confession is so powerful. He said this, he said this, Richard, he said, if, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised you from the dead, you will be saved. What an amazing confession. Paul says it's simple as that. I confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord, and I believe that God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, I am saved. saved. I've come out of darkness into the kingdom of God, come out of darkness into light. I'm a saved man. I've now got a future and a hope for eternity. Wow. Amen. The covenantal confession saves us. This covenantal confession saves us and brings us into a righteous relationship with the King of Kings. Hallelujah. If you're of the truth, you can confess that Jesus is the King. That is, he's the Messiah. You know, most people who say, I believe in Jesus Christ, they're not actually confessing the truth because they don't even know what Christ means. They just think it's part of his name. They have no understanding of what it means to say Jesus Christ. We should slow down and always say something like Jesus the Christ or even change it to Jesus the Messiah to make ourselves and others we are speaking with to stop and think, what are you talking about? What do you mean Messiah? What do you mean Christ? Jesus Christ? It's, you're saying it's, it's not just Jesus Christ. Yeah, sure am. It's Jesus the Christ. There's a huge understanding of who Jesus is. He's the Son of God who died on the cross for us. There's another huge understanding of who Christ is. He's the anointed son of David who was expected to come to be king and rule and reign forever. And Jesus, who is the son of God, is also the Christ who has all that authority, yes. So if you're of the truth, you can confess that Jesus is the king, the Messiah. Nick, next major heading. We are called to keep the commandment. We are called to keep the commandment. In one, back, to, back to 1 Timothy 6.12. The first little heading under that, Nick, is called the calling. Back to 1 Timothy. Back to our, our text passage. Verse 12. Uh, Paul says, Lay hold of it on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession. So to enter an eternal life is dependent upon confessing the good confession. And now under the, under the heading of we're called to keep the commandment, which is in verse 14, that you keep this commandment without spot, 1 Timothy 6.12 says we were called. And that calling is based on our covenantal confession. We are to confess the good confession of who Jesus is And how we have attained to this position. And Paul says, it's in back in verse 12, it's in the presence of many witnesses. So you can go out on the hill and call to tell the cows that you your confession. You know, if that helps you, that's good. But it's much better to find a few people to fellowship with and to be in the presence of witnesses who are also speaking the same word, who are also confessing the word of God. And so the great strength of being in a church fellowship is that you have, you have brothers and sisters, you have fellow witnesses who are speaking the same word as you. So it's enormously encouraging. Amen? I mean, I personally love meetings because I get so encouraged. I hardly ever have a meeting that, I don't, that I'm not happy with, that I haven't been able to lock in with God and get something, receive something. Amen? Because it's in the presence of many witnesses. So... So we call that the apostolic company. And so people from, from Victoria to North Queensland can, can have that confession because they come into this company of apostolic understanding of who Jesus is. They've been set on the right foundation of Jesus the Christ. So our experience in the apostolic company is that each member is able to attain to this confession because they're in the presence of many witnesses who speak the same word, that is, who have the same confession. Amen? And and it's easy to fellowship, isn't it? Walk into Shiloh and mostly you can find someone who who you can just fellowship with in the word because they have the same confession. According to Acts 38, Acts 13, 48b, when Paul and Barnabas were preaching in Perga, the Gentiles, preaching in Perga, The Gentiles heard them gladly. And the Bible says, And as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. The calling is 
to eternal life. The fact that's hard to understand is that God's already appointed you, <laughs> even before you came. Because in his divine foreknowledge, he knew that sooner or later in your life, you were going to say yes. You were going to finally allow all the experiences, good and bad in your life, to push you to Christ. To push you to seek for a spiritual answer to all your questions. And so, as many as have been appointed... I was appointed to eternal life, how about you? Can you say, I, I've been appointed to eternal life? I didn't get to know Jesus till I was 22 years of age, but, but I, I'm, according to the Bible, I'm, I was appointed to eternal life. And not only that, you go to Ephesians chapter 1, and, and Paul says there that God chose us in Christ, when? For the foundation of the world. Why? That we should be holy and without blame in him. In love, he predestined us to the adoption of his sons by Jesus Christ unto himself, to the praise of the glory, according to the good pleasure of his will. Hey, I am saved. I'm, I'm growing up in sonship to God because it pleases God. It's, it's actually the good pleasure of his will. I mean, what a wonderful father we have. He's watching over all these created beings, waiting for each one of them to respond because he's known from eternity that sooner or later they will. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, next little point is keeping the commandment. So 1 Timothy 6.14 says that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ coming, appearing. So the word commandment also means the commission. You know, we rightly or wrongly we call Matthew 28, 18 to 20 the Great Commission. The Bible doesn't need to do that. So it doesn't matter if you drop that, that, that little phrase, because that's a church phrase. We, just all, we need to always be pushing in to the word of God, amen? But what was the, what was the commission or the commandment Jesus gave us in Matthew 28, 19? Go and make disciples of all nations. Because this word commandment not only means commission, it means an injunction, calling on a higher authority. Now, in a former lifetime, I was running a Christian school in the vicinity of Toomba, and we got, I got taken to court by the Independent Teachers Union because we were not paying award wages. Our teachers were ministers. They were sacrificially serving in the school. And I won't tell you all the details, but the, the, short, the long and short of the matter was I received three summons in the mail, one against the school. I think it wasn't two against me as the leader. So I appeared in the magistrate's court, not knowing until I got there, had David Whitehill with me, some of you know, as my solicitor, but when we got there, we found out it was an industrial court and he wasn't allowed to speak in industrial court because he was an ordinary magistrate. He was just allowed to speak in ordinary magistrate's court. This, you needed a, some sort of a union heavy to help you in, the, in this other court. And it was the union who were attacking me, so I was in trouble, eh? But anyway, so, the, so I said to the magistrate, because I had to stand up and speak for myself, I said, sir, we, this is a ridiculous matter and, and we don't want you to pursue these warrants. But the magistrate said, well, I will be. I said, well, I'll be going to the Supreme Court to stop you, to seek an injunction, which I successfully did, praise the Lord. So I went to a higher authority who stopped that magistrate from prosecuting at the union's behest. And the whole thing just died then. Hallelujah. Wonderful story. Could talk about it for hours. Going to the Supreme Court. It was just an amazing experience. But anyway, the fact is, I knew to do that. I don't know how I knew, maybe David whispered on my ear or something. And we sought an injunction from a higher court to stop that magistrate acting. And we succeeded. And the union went home with their tail between their legs. Mm. <laughs> Where were we? It also means an authoritative prescription. So this is pretty powerful, isn't it? What is the basic commandment or commission that we should keep in preparation for the Lord's coming? It's more than the immediate context. The immediate context is flee those things, pursue those things, fight the good fight of faith, and you'll be right for the Lord's appearing. Yes, you will. But what's the greater, what's the greater injunction? What's the greater commandment that we all should be working in? Making disciples of nations. It's urgent. The, truly, the, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. 
Pray the Lord of the harvest that He will raise up workers and thrust them out into the harvest. Amen. Amen. That's another message I'm taking to Africa this time. The harvest is plentiful. We need to raise up workers. Get them ready. We are to be making disciples, not just doing church. Folks, if you find yourself just doing church, take a rain check and, and push in deeper again. Because every meeting of the church can, can play its role in releasing this commandment, releasing this injunction from on high. This is what we're meant to be doing, church. This is why we are the church. Come on. We are to be training the disciples to attain to the good confession. Because then who knows when that disciple that is going to open their mouth. Down the street, in the office, wherever, on the telephone. Suddenly that disciple, if you've trained them, they'll be speaking a good confession. And the person will think, boy, that doesn't sound like you, Mum. Where are you getting that stuff from? Oh, it sounds pretty good. Wow. <coughs> and then, next little heading is without spot. So we keep the commandment. We're meant to be keeping the commandment without spot. And that simply means with a clear conscience. God has cleansed us from an evil conscience, that is, a conscience remembering and accusing us of past failures and sins. The scripture says that baptism out of a good conscience places us in the resurrection of Jesus the Christ far above angels and principalities. Isn't that awesome? The power of, of a good conscience without spot. We are to keep this commandment until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That word appearing, I'm pretty sure, is the word to do with epiphany. And it means actually uh, seeing the face of God. Seeing the face of the Lord when he comes. Amen. So Paul commands us in, in Titus 2.12 to live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age. Why? So that we'll be prepared for his coming. Because verse 13 of Titus 2 says, We are looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. What an amazing confession. Are we, are you looking? Are we looking for the blessed hope? Are you even searching for it? The blessed hope and the glorious appearing or the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour. And who's that one? Jesus. Jesus the Christ. He's called clearly and openly here our great God and Saviour. Hallelujah. I've just got a reference here. Let me see if it's worthwhile. No, I don't know why I got it there. Moving on. So next major heading. Who is he, in inverted commas? The he is inverted commas. Who is he? Now, now, now we're getting to the real crunch of this message and the real challenge of this message. So we're back in 1 Timothy, chapter 6. Verse 15. Which he will manifest in his own time. He, well this, this bit's added, it's in italics, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. So at the beginning of verse 15, who is the he we're talking about? How do you know? You're all so sure of yourselves. How come you answered so quickly? <laughs> hey? <laughs> yes. Come on, explain yourselves a bit better. How, who, who said yes and why did you say yes? Because nobody's seen God at any time. But the only God's son, Christ, he's declared him. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, because I can't get you on video, I won't, I won't drill you anymore. 
But you know, does, does, well, let's just work through it word by word. Who is he? 1 Timothy 6.15 says that he will manifest in his own time. Now this is pretty obvious, but listen to me. Verse 15 comes after the previous verse. Is that right? Previous verses. Where in verse 13, God is referred to. So it could be talking about God. But also in verse 13, Christ Jesus referred to. But then in verse 14, it ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the last, the last words of verse 14 are, until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing, which... So what, what's the which? The appearing. Which he... Who's the he? So just grammatically, am I correct for the educated ones among us, the teachers? Is that, is, are we deriving this correctly and according to English grammar in the sentence? That, that the which is to the appearing and the he is to the Lord Jesus Christ just mentioned. Okay, so we're on reasonable grounds? Because this, this is explosive. What we're about to look at and affirm, and some of you seem to be ahead of me already, it's explosive. Because if you really believe and can prove that these, these two verses are talking about Jesus, you're, you're putting yourself in a position that very few people would put themselves in. It's a very, very dangerous position. Because, yeah, you could be accused of blasphemy, heresy. So you need to be sure of yourself. And, and I've got to confess that I've never, I wasn't clear about this until I heard... Apostle Rob there, talking about this a while back, and referring to this verse a fair bit, weren't you, Rob? For a season, I thought, Rob, Rob's on to something I don't know about here, or else he's deceived. <laughs> and it just started to really challenge me, because I'd never really studied these two verses and asking the simple question, who is he? So most have assumed that the he is referring to God. But in the context it would appear to be referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's the case, Paul goes on to say amazing things about the Lord Jesus Christ that are normally only ever referring to God. Wow. He is referring to God, but in the context it would appear he's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, well, who is the one who will manifest in his own time? It's obviously Jesus, amen? But when Jesus was on earth, he said that the Father was the only one who knew the time of his coming. But now, Paul says, the Lord Jesus will manifest his appearing in his own time. So where did Jesus go to after he left the earth? He told us in John 7, I'm going back to my Father. I'm going back into the glory with my Father, which I had with him before the world was created. And so there's something amazing happened when Jesus went to the Father in that he was fully, in a sense, assumed, consumed, became part of, returned to God. In a sense, Christ is hidden in God. Hey? Yes, it works the other way as well. Because what does Colossians say? For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ our life appears, you will appear with him in glory. So where's Christ? Hidden in God. Amen. And we are hidden with him in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you love this? Oh, Lord, release it, we pray. Release it. So if you want that reference, it's Matthew 24, 36, where Jesus said he didn't even know the time, only the Father knew it. But now, Paul says, he knew the, he knew the time. And then Paul says that he is he, which he'll manifest in his own time, literally, the blessed and only potentate. That he who is is all in italics. But put it in or put it out, it still means the same thing. That this one is going to manifest in his own time is the blessed and only potentate. Let's look at that. That's the heading. The blessed and only potentate. The he we are referring to 
which we have said is the Lord Jesus Christ, is now called the blessed and only potentate. Debbie had a bit of a go at that word in her teaching earlier, and I'm glad she did, because I don't have to go to those references. But um, and we'll come to that word potentate in a minute. We're looking first of all at the blessed. So he's the blessed and only potentate. In Romans 9.5, you want, if you want to check it, turn there. Christ is referred to as being, quote, over all and the eternally blessed God. Note the significance of this, that Christ is referred to as the eternally blessed God. Now that's just shocking, isn't it? Paul says that Christ is the eternally blessed God. We, read, we, we, read a, we talked a little bit a while ago about Titus 2.13 that we are looking for the blessed, hope. the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God, great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, in another book of the New Testament, Paul's writing, it says, Christ, the eternally blessed God. Hmm. So, so brethren, what are we on about? We're on about restoring divinity to Christ. Oh, how we've erred in the centuries. How far have we gone away from the New Testament revelation and preaching and teaching of who Jesus is? And it, it can break your heart when you realise that, that the majority of even believing saved Christians don't know who Jesus is. They don't have a confession that he is God. They, they cannot join with Thomas and say, my Lord and my God. Because what, what we're all expected to believe by faith, Thomas saw the actual evidence. Jesus said, give me a, give me a finger, Thomas. Put it in this hip. Give me a hand, Thomas. Thomas just became totally overwhelmed. He said, my Lord and my God. Thomas was totally convinced because of what he experienced. But Jesus said, you're blessed, Thomas, but more blessed are those who haven't had this experience, but they still believe. Yeah. So when the high priest was interrogating Jesus in Mark 6, 14, 61 and 62, the high priest said, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? In this context, the blessed one is referring to the eternal God. Okay? Jesus said, and in the Greek it's ego emi. He said, I am. And I am is the name that God revealed to Moses in the burning bush. In Exodus 3, 14. Because Jesus identified himself as the son of the blessed God, he was identified, as far as the high priest was concerned, he was, a, he was agreeing that he himself is God. The Jews of that day understood sonship much better than we do today. If someone said God was my father, which Jesus did in John 5, 17, they straight away wanted to kill him because they said, you've blasphemed, you've made yourself to be equal with God. See, the true understanding of a son is the son is equal with his father. The son fully represents the father. If you've seen the son you have, seen the father. So Jesus was identifying himself as God, in so doing, spoke the name of God. He said, I am. He didn't just say, I am the son of the blessed. No, he said the Hebrew word. I am. The word that Moses heard on the holy mountain. And this is what caused the high priest to tear his clothes in verse 63. He and his mates agreed that Jesus had blasphemed the name by saying, I am, and by acknowledging that he was the Son of God. In John 5.18, they wanted to kill Jesus for simply saying God was his Father. So we need to have a bit of a mindset change as the people we are to understand what the, how the Jews thought 2,000 years ago about the understanding of Son and Father, Father and Son. Because without that, the, the, the sort of doctrinal understanding of God as Father, God as Son, God as Holy Spirit, it becomes all blurred and, and not powerful. Because we, we're not understanding what it means to call Jesus the Son of God. So we're trying to distinguish Jesus as a separate person to God and, and number two in the hierarchy almost. But, but that takes you so far away from the revealed truth of the Scripture, of who Jesus is. 
Most are aware of the famous declaration in Jesus John of Jesus in John 8:58. Who can remember? Before him was, I am. And what did they immediately want to do? They took up stones. Why? Because Jesus said he was God. He spoke that Hebrew name of God. Many have a very limited view of who Jesus is. The Jesus that was preached in the 20th century is generally only referred to as a saviour. And that is a wonderful saving revelation. Who got saved in the 20th century? I. But in these days, as God is raising again the ministries of Ephesians 4.11, what's one of the main purposes he gives those ministries? To bring the whole church to the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. And we thank God here at Shiloh that over the last, well, 14 years now, God has been unfolding who Jesus is. He's the Christ, he's the Son of God, and many other wonderful revelations. So now look at this word potentate. The next little heading is, subheading is potentate. What an amazing word even. This word is a very powerful word, referring, referring to a very powerful person who has no one to compare with him. In this verse, there's only one potentate. There's only one sovereign ruler who has unlimited authority. And he's, he's the only potentate. When Peter was testifying of Jesus in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, part of the Pentecostal Day Sermon, he, he declared in verse 36 that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So, you know, Debbie, you need to give us a talk on Lord and Christ there. But, but again, those two titles are different. They're not the same. Otherwise, Peter wouldn't have said two of them. Lord, Lord is from the Old Testament, Adonai, the supreme ruler. Whose own, that word's only ever used in the Old Testament to refer to God. But now God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified both, Lord and Christ. Christ, the anointed king. In Philippians... Paul says, because Jesus was willing to humble himself and come down from heaven in the form of a man and die on a cross, verse 9 says, therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Amen. There's no principality or power even able to stand against you because the name of Jesus is, is totally, what's the word? Full of authority. Yeah. All authority. And his name is above every name. Amen. Authoritative. So then the next little heading is, we're getting there folks, King of Kings. Wow. Oh, and Lord of Lords. Come on. In Revelation 19, 11 to 16, there is an amazing revelation of Christ Jesus sitting on a white horse. Who loves that picture? In verse 11, the rider on the horse is called Faithful and true. In verse 12, the scripture says he has a name written that no one knew except himself. And then in verse 13, his name is called the Word of God. And then in verse 16, the scripture says, On his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Any real kingdom only has one king. So this one is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The white rider on the white horse is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is a clear reference to Jesus the Christ. I don't think anybody would question that. So come back to 1 Timothy 6.15 and Paul says that the one who is the blessed and only potentate is also the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So in all of our discussion... We're seeking to present Jesus the Christ to you to bring you to a fresh understanding of that which is written by comparing Scripture with Scripture and letting the Scripture answer our questions. But that takes away all our doubt. We're not trying to convince you of anything that is not clearly in the Scripture. But if it's clearly in front of you in the Scripture, you need to give it your attention, amen? And that might mean letting go of some of your preconceived ideas about who Jesus is about who God is. 
Any one of us can read the scriptures many times and miss what is finally the simple message in the scriptures. And then Paul says, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, who no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. Now in this scripture, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but I think we could easily say that is referring to God Almighty. That's referring to the Eternal One. But in the context, we've shown that this awesome scripture is actually referring to Jesus the Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh. While Jesus limited himself to a human body when he was on the earth for the predetermined purpose of God, when he returned to the Father, he returned to the glory he had with the Father before the world was. Final heading, Nick. Oh, maybe six. See how we go. Depends whether they shut me down or not. God is one. According to Deuteronomy 6 verse 4, Yahweh or Jehovah is one. He's God. He's one. And so God is always one. You can't start saying that that verse doesn't say what it says. It says what it says. And it's one of the most important scriptures in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is God. Before he came to the earth, Philippians 2.6 says that he was in the form of God. Paul says he, Jesus did not consider it robbery to be equal with God because he was God. In John 5, 17 and 18, Jesus called his father, called God his father, and according to the Jews was making himself equal with God. They wanted to kill him. In John 10.30, Jesus said, I and Father are one. In John 14.7, Jesus said, If you had known me, speaking to one of the disciples specifically, you would have known my Father also. What? Jesus saying, if you had known me, this 33-year-old man about to die, says to one of his disciples, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. What's wrong with you? And from now on, you, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Well, who did they know and who were they seeing? They were seeing Jesus. It's not complex, it's very simple. And in verse 9, Jesus said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And in verse 10, you know, he's really laying it on here, line after line. He says, do, not, do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? This is the oneness of God that's taught in the Scriptures. The Father's in me, I'm in the Father. You can't differentiate, you can't divide. Indivisible. And finally in verse 11, Jesus said, Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me. So why do we need, finally, why do we need a good confession? Why are we talking about all these things from 1 Timothy 6? So that you may have a good confession just as Jesus had a good confession before Pontius Pilate. When Jesus was facing the end, when Jesus knew that a lot of torture was yet to come before he'd be crucified, but would he change his confession? No. And he wants each one of us to be in such a position in Christ that we would also be able to face torture, face death. And not change our confession. But to tell our persecutors the truth. Who was it that's telling me recently that about this guy who was caught in some nation that was illegal to be a Christian? He's a young American fellow and he was thrown into prison. He's apprehended as he's leaving at the airport. Someone else has heard this story, remind me, because I don't know where I heard it. And, and every day they were torturing him and beating him. But the, and, and he started to lose his faith and he said, God, why are you allowing this? And, and anyway, God, God just said, I'm with you, son, and I want you to forgive those who are hurting you. So the next day, the fifth day or whatever it was, he's called into the office of the, the guy who's overseeing the torture and he says, sir, I just want you to know I've already forgiven you. And he put out his hand. And the officer backed away. 
And, and, and the guy kept saying, yes, you know, God's appeared to me and told me to forgive you. And eventually that officer came forward and shook hands. Yeah. And within two days later, he's on a plane back to America. So he got the victory. God appeared to him, said, forgive, forgive these people who are persecuting you. So he went for the head man, who wasn't actually doing it literally, but was commanding it, offered him forgiveness. You know, that's your story, Alberto, about forgiveness. How awesome. So a good confession is, firstly, repenting from evil works and practices and pursuing righteousness and all the good things of God. Secondly, a good confession is having come to that place of covenantal confession. That is, agreeing with and speaking forth the word of God as it is written. We need to know by revelation who Jesus is and speak forth that revelation and knowledge in a good confession. A good confession changes everything. A good confession such as 1 Timothy 3.16 reveals who Jesus is. A good confession can save us as, Peter, as Paul teaches us in Romans. We looked at that. A good confession is a vital part of fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. Praise the Lord.